Hi, and welcome to uh, Pallium Canada's uh, webinar. This is actually the 12th in a series of webinars related to palliative care and the COVID pandemic. Um, today's webinar is focusing on palliative care in hospitals. Um, and that includes the consult services in hospitals um, and palliative care units. We have a fantastic uh, panel today um, of colleagues from out west, from Calgary, from Manitoba, and uh, from Ontario. Um, and they'll be introducing themselves very shortly. Um, do remember that the whole series has been recorded. So if you're wanting to see the series, uh, the other webinars, please go to pallium.ca, the website, and look up the, um, the, the list of resources, and they're all recorded. This one too will be uh, recorded, and we would really encourage you to share it with your colleagues, um, uh, send, it, uh, send a link by emails to your teams and other services. Your microphones are muted. You can imagine we've got several hundred people online and so it becomes very difficult if they're unmuted. Um, we do want to hear from you though. We want to hear your questions and your insights. Uh, we gain a lot of uh, tacit knowledge through these webinars. So please do share your, your insights, your experiences as well. And if you do that, please, we ask you to use the chat function. So if you look at the bottom of the uh, for most people, it's at the bottom, sometimes at the top uh, function. Uh, there's a chat, uh, there's a Q&A function, sorry, a Q&A. We ask you to use the Q&A function, not the chat function. It becomes very difficult for us to track the chat uh, function. So please use the Q&A if you're asking any question um, or submitting a comment. There'll be many uh, comments and questions coming in. Um, we're gonna try our best to address all the questions and we're gonna try and actually intersperse it in, uh, between uh, the uh, panelists' presentations. And then there may be some time, there usually is some time at the end of the webinar that allows us to go back again and address uh, questions that perhaps were not addressed during the actual webinar. I'm uh, Jose Pereira, I'm professor and director um, in the division of palliative care. Department of Family Medicine at McMaster University in Hamilton, and I'm also the Scientific Officer of Pallium Canada. I'm going to hand over now to our panelists to introduce themselves, uh, starting with Amani. Hi, I'm Amani Abdul Razak, and I am a palliative consultant in the Calgary Zone. Um, I have experience working mainly within our inpatient palliative care unit, the IPCU, but also most recently as a consultant at other acute care sites. Hi, I'm Ebru Kaya. I work at Toronto General Hospital, part of uh, University Health Network. I also happen to be the program director for our residency program at UFT for part of medicine. Sorry. Sorry, that's just, I think it's one of the teachers for my children is trying to get hold of them. So I do apologize. I'm trying to find us back on our screen now. Sorry. Good. Thank you, Ibru. No problem. Tim. Tim might be uh, might be muted. I call it snorkeling snorkeling uh, mode. <laughs> Tim Hebert. I'm a palliative care physician and internal medicine uh, practitioner here in Winnipeg. I work for the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority. Um, so we work in various. I work in various hospitals um, and in the community here. I also um, direct our undergraduate medical education uh, for palliative care at the University of Manitoba. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So just as some background information, for those of you who don't uh, know Pallium Canada, we're a non-profit uh, organiz organization across Canada, and we generate our funds largely through um, uh, course registrations for our LEAP courses um, and sales of some of our products like the Pallium Pocketbook. Uh, we partially funded through a contribution by Health Canada, and I really want to um, highlight a, an unconditional education grant support that we've received uh, for these webinar series uh, from Beringer Ingelheim. Um, in terms of declaration of conflicts, um, I am a paid staff member at Pallium Canada, and our other panelists um, have said they've got no uh, conflicts to declare. In terms of the learning objectives, we're hoping that by the end of this webinar, you should be able to describe how the pandemic has impacted the delivery of palliative care in hospitals and the acute care sector. And we thought it'd be a good timing to do this webinar now because you may, some of you may remember two months ago, we did a webinar on 
reorganizing the palliative care systems within the healthcare system. It's, we're now about three months into this whole experience um, with a lot more insights and knowledge and experiences. So we thought this would be very timely to do this one. And then we'll be doing one as well, focusing on community in one or two weeks time. The other learning objective is uh, that you'd be able to explain adaptations to palliative care services that you have had to make um, in the hospitals. Um, and then also start reorganizing hospital-based palliative care services to address the new reality that we're going to be facing. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty about what it can look like, but I think um, certainly amongst the panelists, just speaking to them before we've cut, we came online, um, there's some really interesting insights about what type of changes need to be made uh, moving forward. So I work at University Health Network, UHN, which consists of four separate hospital sites. We have two generalist hospitals. I'm the site lead for Toronto General Hospital. We also have a cancer hospital, which has our 12 bed inpatient palliative care unit. And then we're also part of a rehabilitation institute. Since January, as of last week, our um, UHN institution had seen roughly 281 COVID positive cases, of which we as a palliative care service have seen only a handful of all of these cases. So our, um, we've really had a significant number of changes to our, our service and our institution, you know, both at the institution level as well as our program level. Some of these have happened very, very fast and the changes have been kind of organic and stepwise in some ways. So right at the beginning, um, as an institution, we had to figure out how to increase our inpatient capacity throughout our institution, sometimes as much as adding 50% um, increased number of beds to our programs, which was parallel um, um, in keeping with decanting our patients. So decanting our patients from our inpatient services, particularly the, the transplant services, the um, surgical services, but also our outpatient services, looking at ways of really minimizing our inpatient and outpatient services to be able to cope with the kind of estimated surge in patient volumes that we of course never saw in the end. And the other big um, impact of all the changes was this physical distancing policy that really um, was within our hospital in terms of the no visitor policy that made it very, very difficult. And switching all our activities, including clinical work, to virtual where possible. And then the other big change, of course, was to PPE. You know, we had to make do with limiting using a mask or two masks per day, something that, you know, we would never have, have done in the past, but, you know, it was a new level, a new normal that we had to come to terms with. And then every uh, teaching activity that we had been doing kind of pivoted a change to focusing on building capacity and um, all other teaching activities were stopped. And, and this was in keeping with academic activities in general. All research came to a halt. And in fact, our research staff ended up being redeployed voluntarily to assist with our screening and assessment centers. So within our outpatients, uh, we found that almost all of our, our visits uh, changed to a virtual format within a very short space of time. And really the only ones that we, we couldn't do virtually ended up being either because of practical reasons. For example, in the dialysis patient group, if they were in hospital more often than they were at home, then it just made more sense to see them in, in the hospital. And those urgent same day consults that came from the few on-site oncology clinics that were still in existence. So most of our, um, our visits ended up being on with OTN, but through time, through the past kind of 14 or so weeks, our OTN uh, visits have really transformed to being less and less and being more and more phone calls. And we found that most of this was related to the technical issues that we were experiencing with, with OTN. And our institution has come up with some alternatives uh, to OTN. And I think we're going to see a change in the way we practice virtual care now. And of course, we ended up referring a significant amount of our patients to our community team. So we offloaded a huge amount of our patients and are essentially on standby for the surge of patients that we never ended up seeing. 
Um, within our, specifically within our inpatient consultation model, we looked at tools to help um, improve our efficiency and to mitigate any outbreaks um, and to minimize our footprint on site. And this extended to whatever trainees we still had and then shifting to a virtual way of working within our teams and then looking at um, any kind of equipment or drug supply issues that we might encounter within our whole institution that, that may have impacted us. In the beginning, we were told that some of our medications that we would normally use and be, be used to using particularly for complex um, symptoms or for end of life were to be restricted or limited to ICU. So for example, midazolam, fentanyl. So this was an issue that we really needed to address early on. And we were able to do that successfully, but it took a long time um, to do this, to, to have our leadership see that, you know, this looking at drugs from a, a kind of big picture perspective was more important. Our ICU colleagues could understand and see this, but it was harder for our leadership team, I think. And for our, for our model, we ended up having a stepwise um, change in structure. So initially, we instituted a triage tool to, to really help us identify patients that we could see virtually and those that we really needed to see in person. And we had a, an, an embedded model that we came up with. So we felt with the increase in the volume of patients, it would be really important to embed ourselves within those frontline units but it was clear from the outset that our small number of teams wasn't going to cut it with regards to being able to provide this level of service. So we partnered with some colleagues that we felt had uh, kind of suitable skill sets, such as psychiatry, family medicine, to redeploy them to us, to our teams, to help us with this embedded model of care. And then the other area that we looked at was all the ambulatory clinics that, that had halted or stopped and to really look at utilizing some of the skilled nurses that we had in those clinics that had slowed down to again shift them into the inpatient service to help us cope with the surge in patients. And then finally, in our final step was to have um, an MRP model to, to assist with taking, uh, offloading some of the patients to, that were in our medicine teams but we felt would be much more suitable to be under our care that we would normally be following as a consultation service. You know, we have a, a 12 bed palliative care unit at the, the cancer hospital, but we don't really have a similar palliative care unit for any non-cancer patients. So this really was an area that a huge gap and we felt by having this MRP model, we could address that gap appropriately. Um, within our health uh, care unit, we also needed to have a few changes. So we revised our admission policy to make it a bit easier, more efficient to transfer patients to our, to our PCU. Again, we increased our bed capacity. So um, all our private beds became semi-private beds. And again, the, the biggest issue for us was really dealing with the strict no visitor policy and the scaled back kind of skeletal staffing that we had. And we felt that by essentially ensuring that we prioritize the staff for our PCU over the consult service or the outpatients was probably a good way to handle any um, shortages or sickness within our staff. And then the virtual huddles and family meetings virtually was another change that we never see um, you know, coming prior to this pandemic. We did have to do some changes to some of our policies and order sets. And this was really in respect to um, recognizing that there were some actual and potential drug shortages. We really wanted to make sure that there was sufficient appropriate alternatives within some of these order sets and policies that we had to make sure that you know, we wouldn't run into any problems down the road. And we ended up creating lots of new partnerships, not just for PCU, but generally throughout. For example, initially we started off with three CAD pumps at our two um, uh, general hospitals. And clearly this wouldn't be enough for any surge in patients that we were worried about. So we ended up partnering with our acute pain service. Given that all the elective surgical procedures were on halt, uh, we were able to, to repurpose their pain pumps 
to, to use in our patients. So that was really a very successful partnership. And then in ICU, we ended up uh, revising their um, life sustaining um, therapy, life um, withdrawals, life support withdrawal policy to incorporate again some additional um, medications in the face of drug shortages or some alternatives that might really be better for making sure that we were conserving drug supply throughout our institution. A uh, significant amount of our time and effort was around building capacity within primary palliative care. We invested so much time and energy on creating educational materials, webinars, order sets for all our teams to use because again our numbers are so small we're spread out over four hospitals and had an extensive outpatient um, uh, clinical service to essentially whittle down to a small amount and we felt this was really the, 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 the better kind of use of our time and in speaking with some of our medicine colleagues who have looked after COVID patients, certainly their experience has been that these order sets were definitely worthwhile. They were in use, the guidelines were in use, the guidelines that we created, created to the extent that really that was one of the reasons for not referring amongst others to our, to our team. And things that I found that really were very helpful was the fact that, you know, leveraging any existing infrastructure that we currently had was was really useful for example we had certain committees that were already in existence particularly ones that that gave us um, um, a presence at leadership circles so repurposing those committees to covid ones really helped to make some of the changes the rapid changes that we needed to make and um, keeping tab of any um, changes within our policies and our protocol and creating a kind of a policy around pandemics I think was really important because you know if we're ever faced with this again then we've got something that we can work from rather than scrambling to put together and create something which is what happened in, in, in our case in March and April. Uh, maybe I'm just wondering, it's Jose here, um, just um, uh, uh, as a segue going to Tim's uh, part of the presentation, you did mention that um, you're a relatively small group, and, and I think that that's the reality right across the country for most palliative care groups. And you mentioned that, if I understood you correctly, that at one point in the hospital, or at least one of the hospitals, you would take, you were, you offered to take over the M MRP role for some patients to reduce the load of the okay. internal medicine, is, is that correct? And if so, how did it go and, and what impact did it have on already small resources? Yeah, so uh, in talking to our medicine colleagues, um, you know, it was clear that, that they were very worried, um, again, about their staffing and the fact that they didn't think that they had the staffing to be able to deal with a surging volume. So we felt, you know, looking at our existing um, skill set, it would make much more sense for us to guide them on patients that we felt would be much better positioned to be under our care. I mean, we've been working for decades to try to create a part of care unit at our institution. Um, it's really not going to happen for a number of reasons. And we felt really this was a way of being able to demonstrate how that might work. Um, we didn't end up ever needing to utilize that. We got as far as the embedded model, Jose, but within the embedded model, again, we never needed to initiate redeploying other physicians to our service. We were able to do that within our, keep that within our team. Our, our consult numbers came down, went down so significantly. It, 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 we'd, I'd never seen our service as quiet as it was during the pandemic. It's since come back up to normal numbers, but really it was only until last week where we started to come back to our normal numbers. Up until then, we were really well below our usual clinical volumes. Thanks very much. Um, that's very helpful. Uh, thanks, Tim. Over to you. Uh, good afternoon. So I'm going to talk about um, our experiences here in Winnipeg, Manitoba over the last couple of months. Um, could we go to the next slide, please? 
So just to describe our context, our, our palliative care team um, provides regional service. So that means we, we do the inpatient work and the outpatient work um, kind of as a single team. We have three acute hospitals and three subacute. We have one tertiary care palliative care unit. Um, we had a small number of cases in Manitoba. And so mostly I'll be talking about the impacts that um, the pandemic concerns and restrictive policies have had. Uh, next, next slide, please. Um, I'm going to talk first about some of the effects that visitation restrictions. Um, very early on, we found that our units were overwhelmed with visitors and it wasn't possible to follow our public health officers uh, guidelines. Um, and, and subsequent to that, we had restrictions that only patients who were imminently passing were permitted to have visitors and this and only two visitors and that was very restrictive. Um, in the last week, we've had some increasing up to four visitors for certain patients. Um, we've had some challenges with the visitation policies be very, being variable in various parts of our health region, meaning then that if a patient was in a place where visiting was more permissive, they wouldn't want to come to a palliative care unit. And this contributed to us having um, open beds um, very much of the time and a lot less um, referrals for transfer. And we found that our beds were quite underutilized for especially the first month to six weeks of, of the pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. Um, given our inability to be in the same place with, with families, we found it very difficult to support families. We've done work with um, virtual visiting um, and it, however, has been difficult to, to maintain com contact with many families. Um, we have found that supporting patients in, in PCH has also been a problem and we've had several instances where families have chosen to remove their families from personal care homes or long-term care, but to do so without receiving any support or even notifying any healthcare team members. And I received a few phone calls of, from um, panicking family doctors asking for help when someone was imminently dying without any support in the community. Um, and on other occasions presenting very late to the emergency room um, when it was really too late to help. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we've had some challenges with staff having to self-isolate. And then in order to minimize our imprint, we're not, we're limiting each staff person is basically staying at the same site and working kind of constantly. I've been working nonstop since March. Um, and so that's a bit tiring, I'll say. Um, we had a very significant decline in consults in April, probably less than half of our usual. As of this week, we're probably at something close to normal, but still not quite. Um, we have less, there are less admitted patients everywhere in Winnipeg. Um, I think that um, the lack of family presence is leading to less advocacy for patients. And um, um, we've had a lot more um, taunt telephone consultation um, and, and also staff in isolation. Um, of course, we've had patients presenting very late and dying during acute workup. I was on um, internal medicine last week and I had six patients die in my care in four days, uh, which was staggering. Next, next slide, please. Um, we've, as I've mentioned, we've had open beds. There's been a degree of moral distress on our, on our palliative care units relating to visitation and isolation of patients and the loneliness that that's caused. Delirium has been a very challenging symptom to manage when, when families are not present to support their loved ones. And we've been restricted in our use of treatments that would be considered aerosol generating. Um, the workload for our nurses has increased despite the lower numbers because of all the phone calls that they're making and the things that they're doing to try to support families over the phone or with iPads and whatnot or visits. And PPE, of course, has been a barrier. Next slide, please. Um, um, loneliness and hopelessness has been something we've been seeing quite a bit with, with the patients under our care um, with increased concern for anxiety and depression. There have been a number of patients where feeling hopeless in the setting of isolation has been mentioned as a reason 
for for wanting to talk about MAID or even wanting to proceed with MAID. I'm not going to say that this means that there's going to be more um, medically hastened uh, dying during COVID, just that we've had a few cases where the isolation has been a contributing factor for some individuals. And certainly uh, impaired communication has been a big issue. And on occasion, families that are not only frustrated, but even angry about some of those things. Also having patients be discharged when we know that the plan isn't really adequate, but families and patients themselves are desperate to leave the hospital so that they don't have to be alone from each other. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we have circulated uh, some guidelines um, and we had also developed, you know, a, what was going to be a COVID palliative care team with some volunteers from our nursing, CNS and physician team, which was never necessary because we never had a big wave of cases. Um, and in terms of supporting families, we've had virtual visits using tablets and phones, um, using the solarium on the main floor so the patients and their families can see each other through windows, which is, is labor intensive for our social work and spiritual health, but has been great uh, for, for the patients and their families. Um, I'm, I'd like to give a lot of credit to spiritual care and social work for the tremendous work that they've been doing to support families in those ways. Um, at the end of March, I came across a tool on Facebook of all places, um, which was called Meet My Loved One, which is, came from the University of Alabama. Um, we took that tool and, and modified, it, modified it for the Winnipeg context. And um, it's been applied um, for use in all of our region's intensive care units and palliative care units. It's, it's a tool that allows us to ask some of those important dignity questions about about the patients that we're caring for so that the families know that we're we're interested in their loved ones as individuals rather than as a just as a patient and our icus have been doing a lot of good work to support um, patient-centered and dignified care family liaison volunteers and a lot of work on virtual family presence including presence in rounds uh, next slide please this is uh, just a graphic of the Get to Know My Loved One tool, the, the first page of it to give you an idea of what that looks like. We had medical students, we're having medical students fill this out and medical students off service and now first year medical students who are on summer break are doing this work in the ICUs. Um, medical residents are doing it on our rotations. Uh, next slide. Okay, we can go on, next one again. Um, moving forward, we've had significant challenges here in terms of being in, included at the table when, when regional planning has been taking place. So something that we uh, need to work on is having more involvement um, when, when planning at a high level is happening. Um, these events have emphasized the importance of having a palliative care inpatient unit at all tertiary care centers. We currently have a palliative care unit at one of our tertiary care centers and um, has also emphasized the value of having concomitant care models where we can work side by side with, with physicians and teams that are providing more acute, um, acute models of care. Upsides that I've observed over the last uh, several weeks, there's an increasing recognition across all of the domains here that, the important, that, that providing compassionate and patient-centered care is extremely important. We're seeing that in the emergency departments across all levels of acute care. And we've had um, greatly increased cl collaboration with spiritual care, social work, and also with the ICUs, interestingly, and, um, and a broad base of support for palliative care among nursing staff and allied health. We're also learning that more people can stay at home if those decisions are being made. As we're having, I don't know statistics at this time, but it, it's clear that we're having more people stay at home for end of life now than we have in the past. Uh, next slide. So I don't know. Um... Uh, sorry to say, yeah. Um, quick question. Um, the, the, one of our colleagues on the on the Q and A asked um, uh, for those patients who are not admitted into hospital. What were the type of resources um, that were available to them in the community? And you don't have to go into it in detail because I think this is the topic 
um, of the webinar that we're hoping to present in two weeks' time. But in your region, um, you in your presentation, you mentioned that there were some challenges with them, uh, with lack of, perhaps in one or two cases, with the transition into community. Uh, were there specific, were there more resources allocated for home-based care? And unfortunately, we didn't get any extra resources for home-based care. And our community nurses received uh, direction to, especially during April, to restrict all home visits to those that were deemed essential or urgent. Um, we maintained contact with, with patients um, with telephone calls and through their coordinators. We have a coordinator-based system. Um, I did. I was isolated for three weeks, and during those three weeks, I was on the phone more or less constantly with patients and families, um, doing virtual visits, and that was one way um, that I was able to, to to support those families. Great, thank you. There's some other good questions coming in. I think what I'll do is I'll keep them to the end, and perhaps at this point, I'll hand over to Amani. Thanks. Thank you, Jose, and thank you, Tim, and I appreciate the opportunity to. Uh, be able to share our Calgary acute care experience and sort of compare notes between sites as well. So I just wanted to start off by saying in the Calgary zone, we, we haven't had a, a lot of acute care palliative involvement in COVID-19 cases. So in the Alberta context, long-term care residents have unfortunately seen the preponderance of cases with about 72% of COVID related deaths being in long-term care residents and many of those people not being transferred to hospital. We have been involved in a small number of end of life situations, um, sometimes by phone in the acute care sites to minimize exposure to healthcare providers and, and therefore other patients and also to help preserve PPE and a small number of in-person consultations as well, but not a ton. So I will be focusing more generally on the impact of uh, COVID-19 related policies in the hospital on our palliative care service. Um, we have seen decreased volumes overall. So in Calgary, we have palliative consultation services at all four adult hospital sites, as well as an intensive palliative care unit at the Foothills Medical Center, which is our admitting palliative care unit. Um, there, are, there are lots of speculations about why we have decreased volumes, similar to what I've heard other speakers say. Um, our occupancy rates overall in hospital are lower. So for example, in April of 2020, uh, our occupancy was at, sitting at 74%, where we're usually hover in the low to mid 90s. Um, in addition, we suspect that patients and families are fearful to come in because of the restrictive visitation policies in our palliative care population. That's very important, and possibly because of this frail population having a higher risk if they did contract the infection. The next slide, thank you. I'm just going to myself off here. Okay, so um, other implications. So we definitely have much less family presence in the hospital, um, as we've heard, I've heard from other sites. There, and there are definitely lots of related challenges. So um, that reduced family presence, we think about the myriad of impacts that that has on care uh, for patients and their families and distress, the fact that family members aren't there to advocate and if we think about how that might impact very common clinical scenarios, for example, in a delirium assessment, how much we rely on that collateral history from family members and somebody that you've just met who might have a bit more of a mild subtle presentation or underlying cognitive impairment, just a small example. In addition, in addition um, I think frequently about the importance of relational autonomy, and we know that people's decisions are often influenced by a complex network of social relationships and their roles in family structures. And so um, anecdotally, I've had experiences, unfortunately, where people have had a bit of a decisional paralysis because of not having that support uh, available from their family members. Um, and I think we're tasked as healthcare providers of being the liaison for family members. So at the same time, we have to be their eyes and ears, telling them and relaying what's going on and also helping with some of this complex communication, all while they may never actually see us in person. So it's, it's a large task and we're asking people to trust us when they may never actually see us. I think also about the complex discharges, similar to what you were alluding to, Tim. So patients are keen to get out and families are keen to have care for them at home, especially in an end of life context. Um, and, and yet there are limited supports in the community. Uh, so families are tasked with managing very complex cases at home. And I think it's sometimes an unfair trade-off because they're having to decide between 
really strong support and symptom control in the hospital setting versus spending time together as a family at the end of life. And then in the hospital versus hospice context in Calgary, we're pretty lucky in the sense that we have six residential hospices with um, over 100 beds. But our hospices are owned by different organizations. Some, a few are owned, or I should say one really is owned through uh, Alberta Health Services, whereas others are owned by long-term care facilities um, and other organizations. So the visitation policies vary quite widely from hospice to hospice. In some cases, hospital visitation policies can be more liberal. And so in that situation, sometimes fam patients and families do not want to go to hospice. They would rather stay in the hospital. So next slide. So I feel like I've been talking about a lot of negatives and, and yet it goes on, unfortunately. So speaking of some of the other negative highlights, communication and rapport building in the context of PPE. I mean, these are just basic things for us. We understand the importance of nonverbal communication and how that can be dampened by the use of masks and face shields and physical distancing measures. Um, in addition, I'll talk a bit more about the family-centered care piece. And I have a really sort of um, a lovely CNS that I work with that I really respect. And she once said to me, it feels like we're doing this stripped down reductionist approach to palliative care. And really, we were talking about how sometimes we were limited in scope to simple phone consultations in uh, suspected or confirmed COVID-19 positive cases. And also the fact that we have less interdisciplinary team involvement. So for example, on the uh, IPC or palliative care unit, we have, we have a really richly resourced multidisciplinary team. And yet, unfortunately, a lot of those team members are unable to work at this time. For example, our volunteers, our music therapists, our recreational therapists. So we feel like we're not necessarily providing that holistic care. In addition, there's definitely healthcare provider distress about a wide variety of issues, hospital and public health policies, that seem to be perpetually changing and hard to keep track of. The uncertainty about COVID-19, not just the policies and changes, but even in terms of how this disease works, and concern about your own health and family and loved ones as well. So next slide, please. I would say that uh, this, yeah, so, so the good highlights here is that ACP is top of mind, um, especially for those who are at high risk of serious COVID-19 infection. And I would argue that those are generally the high priority, that's the high priority group for ACP as well. So those who, um, those, if we think about who needs goals of care conversations most urgently, it's those who are frail, have multimorbidity or immunocompromised and have respiratory disease, for example. So that is our high priority group. Um, in addition, I think that palliative care providers have emerged as leaders. Uh, we have been volunteering our knowledge and have been asked to share our knowledge as well. So, for example, in the Calgary zone, our internal medicine colleagues reached out to us to provide education in the form of webinars through our U of C CPD program. Uh, and some of our team members have done webinars on topics such as advanced care planning and palliative sedation. In addition, we have been asked to lend support to our colleagues. So our critical care colleagues and internal medicine colleagues have voiced interest in palliative care providers as a source of psychological support for their teams. And I think it does highlight the need for universal foundational palliative education. I think that's a bit of the battle cry for Pallium Canada. And I think that's what's happening now in the, in the midst of this pandemic. So if we can take that as a silver lining, we know that all healthcare providers should have a fundamental palliative approach to care. Um, and I think that as palliative care providers, we have a unique lens, a palliative care lens when looking at a pandemic. So if, um, I think palliative care incorporates elements such as sensitive communication about difficult news uh, and the importance of the ACP, advocating for patient right for symptom control and comfort, and not forgetting those who may not be appropriate for or selected for ICU level interventions, and indeed identifying those people as a high priority group. So really, I think palliative care presents an option and a suite of interventions when other medical care may be withdrawn. So looking at the plans and changes, we definitely did a lot of planning. Uh, we did not see the surge that we were worried about. It remains to be seen if we'll have subsequent waves of this. But I think that we have done a lot of work around surge planning, and I'm more familiar with our IPCU surge plans. 
we did use this reference um, for it published recently in CMAJ, and I think a lot of people are probably familiar with this, and it's been discussed in previous webinars as well. So pandemic palliative care beyond ventilators and saving lives. And we adapted that to our local context as well. Um, so we did look at priority groups that we, if we needed to triage consults, who would we, we would, and sorry, and admitting folks under us as well, who would we be prioritizing? Um, and also looking at that sort of phase one to four model that we see in critical care and in emergency medicine. I should note that our palliative care unit was not designated as a COVID unit, regardless of the phase, even if it was sort of phase four, what I call zombie apocalypse, like we were not to be designated as a COVID unit. But yet, similar to what you were saying, Ebru, our uh, IPCU MDs were in agreement to provide MRP care for end of life COVID patients, potentially on a separate unit, if that was needed in a sort of phase three or four setting to help offload from our, our non palliative colleagues in internal medicine, for example. We did have backup planning and we do have backup shifts for on call. Um, and we did have really good, we do have good staff availability people's trips are canceled, they're not going anywhere, and people are willing to work. So we have had to have staff in isolation because, you know, awaiting COVID test results or having upper respiratory tract-like infections. So we've had to use that kind of backup uh, on-call system, but it's worked well. And then similar to what the, uh, the other two speakers were saying, we did focus a lot on building capacity for our non-palliative care colleagues so that they could become more comfortable with a primary approach to palliative care. And some examples of that are our uh, quick tips sheets on symptom management uh, and palliative sedation. Um, and those can be found, some of those, so sorry, palliative sedation, symptom management for adult patients with COVID-19 receiving end of life care out of the, outside of the ICU, and a guideline for the treatment of opioid neurotoxicity. Those are some examples. Those can be found on our uh, internal website that's accessible to all Alberta Health Services staff. In addition, Dr. Jessica Simon with some other people has worked on um, a COVID adapted serious illness conversations guide. So that's uh, what we saw out of Ariadne Labs out of Boston. And I think each local group has probably adapted that or many different groups have has adapted that to their context. Next slide. So just briefly here, similar to what other people were saying, a lot of in-person meetings have been canceled. Our educational, um, our teaching seminars have not been canceled, but a lot of things have been moved to online and Zoom. And I found that a bit challenging as an educator as well, uh, perhaps a little bit less engaging. Um, and then thinking about our multidisciplinary rounds. So on our unit, for example, it's had to be really stripped down because of physical distancing uh, requirements. We've not been able to have our full complement of our multidisciplinary team available. Next slide. And then think, um, thinking ahead even more, I think we have to think about grief support for people that have had loved ones who've died in acute care during this time. Um, Tim, you spoke about isolation and the impacts that that can have for patients and the distress it can cause to families. And I would say with the restricted visitation policies, even for the loved ones who are able to visit, they're having to shoulder a lot of the burden of seeing their loved ones so sick and deteriorating on their own and the impact that that can have on them psycho psychosocially can be, you know, we don't really know, but I, I, it's intuitive that it would be quite heavy. Um, people are mourning alone, whether that's anticipatory grief, as I'm talking about having to see their loved ones alone, um, and also after the fact, when somebody dies, we know that their traditional funeral services are definitely on hold. The literature does suggest that these types of factors can increase the risk for complicated grief. And I think we have to look at that in the future. I know the Calgary Grief Support Program has responded somewhat by increasing the amount of the number of counselors that are available and expediting uh, the referrals for counseling. Usually they wait about six months from death to counseling services because they're they feel you know they want to have time to process the death and allow for more meaning making but because people are more socially isolated at this time they've expedited those services i think we have to look at the impact on healthcare providers in the future as well for many of the reasons i've brought up there was a really interesting paper published uh, there's a qualitative paper during uh, looking at a palliative care group's um, perspective uh, during the sars cov one pandemic, and this is in Singapore, and one of the themes that they had come across was this idea of the sufferer caring for the suffering, 
So because of the uncertainty that I alluded to earlier, um, and also because healthcare workers, their friends and family are potentially affected with the disease or the risk of infecting loved ones and yourself with the disease, and the voluntary isolation of, of healthcare providers from family members to protect them as well, and many other factors it, it, um, resulting in healthcare provider distress. They also brought up this interesting theme around the difficulty of being there, being present for patients uh, while donning this burdensome PPE. So I think that lastly, if future waves arise, we have to think about in Calgary, we are lucky to have a cohesive group between acute care and the community, um, but how can we redeploy within our service to be a bit more fluid? Because this wave, we found that our community colleagues were anecdotally more busy uh, versus us in acute care. So how can we uh, respond a bit better if a future wave arises? And the very last point I wanted to bring up was around family-centered care again. Uh, I would say that palliative, as palliative care providers, I would say that we're experts in communicating sensitive topics. I would put forth to you that we should be considering taking a leadership role and teaching other uh, healthcare providers how to discuss difficult news about hospital policies and visitation policies, resource limitations in the context of this pandemic and future waves. Uh, so, for example, we're, we're experts at acknowledging feelings and carefully explaining the rationale behind certain policy changes. Uh, and I think that's probably the first step in preserving family-centered care. There's been interesting work looking at developing a structured approach to maintaining communication with family members. Some of this is intuitive to us and things we probably do already, but having that structured approach that can be a bit more of a standard of care, I think would be helpful. So, for example, assigning a family representative to help with healthcare provider and family communication, daily check ins from the healthcare provider to a family member, encouraging family members to have these asynchronous diaries where they can journal their feelings and, and questions that they may not remember while speaking to a healthcare provider, and facilitating video conferencing calls. So, for example, on our palliative care unit, we do have tablets that were given to us um, to allow video conferencing between patients and family members. I do like this one line I read in another paper stating you know, progress hopefully is going to be the result, not regression in family-centered care in the midst of this pandemic. And hopefully we can lead the way as palliative care providers. Excellent, Amani, thank you very much. Um, I was wondering, uh, just as a segue to one of your last points, you mentioned about the tablets and, you know, uh, iPads, et cetera, that people have been using to connect outside. And one of our participants, Catherine Andrews, asked, what about patients, um, um, is it affecting contact? So, so we, we, we're moving more towards virtual care. Um, is there a risk perhaps um, of maybe going too far in the pendulum to the other end and then having to come back uh, to, to identify when is it appropriate to do in-person versus when is virtual care particularly as this seems to be a sort of a slow burn or an ongoing burn. Um, and then another uh, participant asked related to that, are there resources out there to help patients um, with visual or hearing impairments to remain socialized and in contact uh, when they are hospitalized and there's no contact with family, friends, and FaceTime doesn't work, um, TV doesn't work? Any comments from any of you? Um. I'll make a comment. Um, at one of our facilities, it was possible if a patient could be in a wheelchair um, to bring them down to the first floor. Uh, and there, were, there was an, an atrium area where there was um, windows right out to where the sidewalk was. So as many personal care homes have been doing across Canada, um, we had window visits in one of our facilities. And that was possible if a patient was, was well enough to be able to sit in some form of a chair. Um, in terms of patients who had visual or sensory impairments that were too severe, I'm afraid we haven't had great answers locally in Winnipeg for them. We have found though that families themselves have benefited even when a person is unresponsive, that still doing a Zoom or a FaceTime was beneficial for the family, just so that they could see their loved one, even if their loved one couldn't respond to them, but they could see them, they could, they could speak to them, um, and it was meaningful for families, even if it was only one way. Thank you. 
Anyone struggling with that whole finding the balance between virtual now and with the reopening face to face and how you're trying to bridge that or do you anticipate that might be an issue? I, I do worry about it being an issue. I think the one thing this has highlighted is that how important it is. I mean, we've already, we already knew this, but it just highlights it further, how important it is for family members to be with their loved ones, especially when they're unwell. So I don't see that as being kind of a source of inertia um, when things open up, but I think our healthcare policies, so we have, it's a bit clunky sometimes. So I think as we per, are progressing through the phases and reopening things up again, I do hope that we can catch up accordingly with respect to our policies. For example, right now, just a very specific example, some of our hospices are maintaining their one visitor at a time in the last two weeks of life kind of situation where you can go and get your hair cut out in the community. So there are certain things that don't seem to align or catch up as quickly. So I think we continue to look, I hope we continue to look at that. Yeah, I, I agree with the money. We were we were functioning through the month of April. The palliative care units in Winnipeg were much more restrictive in visitors than the rest of the hospital system, mm -hmm. simply because it, when we were more open, we felt flooded with families. And now that Manitoba is on phase two of of a reopening strategy, they're more strict now than they were four weeks ago, and it's it's conf it's confusing. In, in Toronto, um, what we're, so we're planning on reopening in our program as well as the whole institution, you know, locally and regionally. And we're finding that we have, our, our patients seem to fall in two groups. You know, the group that seems fairly literate with technology and kind of healthcare in general, and then the group who are more likely to be elderly or from certain communities, more vulnerable, who have less access to kind of technological um, devices, or if they do have a smartphone, they don't necessarily know how to use it to be able to access either OTN or Zoom. And so I think we're really um, are having difficulties in trying to come up with a kind of a plan or a process a one size fits all and we're learning that we just have to be as flexible as we possibly can and it might be that you know we have clear kind of clinical reasons for wanting to see a patient in person and there might be good clear reasons for continuing that physical distancing but then the needs of the or preferences of patients really sometimes trump all of those and um, so we've had to be a lot more flexible in, in our approach. It's interesting. I think that uh, what you just said um, is also very applicable to the community and home care. And I think uh, community teams, as we'll hear in our uh, webinar, I think in about two weeks time, are struggling with that as well to get back into doing face-to-face -face visits. I was intrigued by something, and that is a common experience that the three of you described and that we've experienced in our, in our program as well here in Hamilton. And that is that in the hospitals, we prepared ourselves to see all these patients and then ended up with not seeing many um, yet you know colleagues in the in critical care and the emergency department um, ended up seeing a lot of them um, and were doing the part of care so my question is any observations or insights on how prepared were our colleagues across these different fields and different areas and services to provide a part of care approach and what should we be doing moving forward because i, I in my service, in my part of, in the part of care team that I, uh, uh, unit that I work in, we had a really um, awkward situation, awful situation of a patient who was still early in the illness trajectory, became COVID positive, and we had to move him from the part of care unit because we had an outbreak to uh, to one of the hospitals, um, and um, and there was a um, a resident who called us up to berate us that he wasn't receiving good part of care because he was seeing part of care only in terms of the end of life. So what can we be doing differently? Um, or should we be doing anything about empowering our colleagues with these um, competencies and skills? In, in our area, Jesse, what, what we've seen is that providing the educational materials and tools has definitely helped our colleagues to be much more independent and self-sufficient and to be able to cope with the kind of mild or moderate symptom cases. 
we were worried that we might see patients with very, very severe, difficult to manage symptoms. That hasn't happened. In fact, um, most of our colleagues have been able to manage. We have really good relationships with um, our medicine colleagues and our intensive care colleagues to, to begin with. What we ended up doing was establishing a kind of coaching service for them. So we weren't necessarily needing to go in and see these patients ourselves, but we were providing them with assistance and guidance, you know, a voice on the phone for them to, to call up to say, here's the case, this is what I'm thinking, you know, does this make sense? So we kind of established that. Um, we also had a regional ICU committee that we established where I was a kind of health care representative to help again guide some um, kind of policy decisions, planning decisions, or even like clinical scenarios, again, to provide that coaching assistance where needed. And I found that, uh, certainly in my experience, it was really helpful to, to help to make sure that, you know, e even though we weren't necessarily uh, directly involved with patient care, that the quality of care for our patients was as good as we could, we could have it. Okay. We've had kind of a good news, good news, bad news experience here in Winnipeg. Um, about two years ago, uh, you know, working together with ICU, we had developed um, a withdrawal of life-sustaining therapy order set to be used within critical care. Um, and that was part of kind of some ongoing work. Um, but I would say in general that palliative care is underutilized in our ICUs in, in Manitoba. During, during the pandemic period, the quality team for critical care worked very hard to maintain patient family contact. And so that that was something that I gave a little bit of kind of kind of con, um, content expertise to, but really that they did on their own. And I think reaching out to the quality team is going to be the way that we're going to be able to move forward with improving uh, palliative care within our critical care uh, setting. I think jo just uh, going back to your question, Jose, about um, you know in the future what we might do for our non-palliative care colleagues as well. I think we didn't even really know in the first wave at the beginning what end of life would look like. You know what was the average number of days? Let's say when somebody left the ICU, we realize now it's very short. They may not make it outside of the ICU, or somebody who didn't. Uh, wasn't quote unquote appropriate for ICU level care. It's also quite a short trajectory. So I think really we're looking not at big picture palliative care, we're looking at end of life care. So hopefully if we can continue our education um, on the basic symptom management that you've talked about, everyone, we've had a similar experience. For the most part, they don't seem to be very complex, difficult to manage cases. So I think it lends itself to a primary palliative approach to care. So hopefully we can just continue on with that education. Very good. Have any of you been seeing or experienced, or, or let me rephrase the question. Um, some of thinking that in terms of getting palliative care integrated into um, uh, the care, you know, into cr chronic illness care, for example, and getting it integrated much earlier, that with COVID, we were, we were going two steps forward and we may have gone now three steps back uh, because it's sort of uh, sort of isolated part of care again to the very last days or hours of life. Have, you, have any of you experienced that? And, and if so, um, how will we regain that ground? I think it's always been an identity issue for, for us, at least in my experience. And I agree though, I'm, I do worry that this adds another monkey wrench into the issue. Um, we keep talking about how palliative care needs to be involved early on and how we're not about end of life care and yet what's up top of people's minds now is a very much end of life picture so um whenever you know i don't know what the end of COVID, the COVID pandemic will look like or when that will happen but i think we have to redouble our efforts um in the future I think one of the best strategies at moving moving palliative care upstream, which is what most of us would feel strongly is appropriate, is to get to the new doctors, to, to work with undergraduate, with clinical clerks, to work with, um, with trainees early in the residency, and to sort of help them set a tone for practice. And I, this, is, this is what I try to do, and I think it, I think it can be effective. To say, I agree with um, what Amani and Tim has said, but in, in my experience, that worry hasn't played out so, so far. If anything, 
things that we were working on for decades, we've managed to to kind of do in the space of a few weeks. I mean, we have yeah. all the sets integrated into our EPR system that we were told was never gonna happen ever until we got a brand new EPR system that was in the works 10 years time. So in many ways, actually, we've had so many things go um, towards us in terms of helping us than the, the other way. I mean, time will tell, it might be that there are some things that we do end up going backwards in, but I think in many ways it has assisted health of care. Great point. Very good. Okay, we're, we're at, uh, at the end. Um, any last thoughts from anyone? And then I'll do the wrap up. Good. So let me take this opportunity to thank, uh, thank uh, all three of you, uh, Amani, Ibru, Tim, for your time, for your insights. Um, it was fascinating to see some themes right across and it's different parts of the country, similar themes. Uh, we heard about opportunities going forward, um, ongoing questions that we could that need to be addressed. Um, I also heard development of fantastic resources and maybe it's time that uh, collectively we somehow get together across the country to try to bring those together and the learnings together so that we can get some uh, learnings from each other and also some sort of standardization as well. Um, to all the participants, thank you for taking the time off on a, on a Friday afternoon to join us. Uh, the session has been recorded, so it will be made available within a day or two. You'll be getting an email um, to that effect. Um, and you'll find it again on the pallium.ca website under the webinars. The recording will be there, will be there and our panelists have very kindly uh, allowed us to make available the slides. So you'll have the slides available in PDF uh, form. So once again, thank you. Stay safe and keep up the fantastic work across the country. Panelists, thank you very much. Stephanie and the Pallium team, thank you for supporting this. Bye, everyone. Thank you.